Israel prepared to handle any Iran scenario, defense chief says. Israeli Defense Minister Yov Gallant stated that Israel is prepared to handle any potential scenarios arising from tensions with Iran. This statement follows threats from Tehran in response to the killing of Iranian generals on April 1st. Iranian officials warned that Israeli embassies were not safe, and a graphic was published showing weapons capable of striking Israel. Gallant emphasized Israel's readiness after conducting an assessment with senior military officers. Chief of General Staff Herzi Halavai affirmed Israel's capability to deal with Iran both offensively and defensively, with cooperation from the USA and regional partners. Iran has threatened retaliation for a suspected Israeli strike in Damascus, which killed seven Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps members. A senior advisor to Iran's supreme leader stated that none of Israel's embassies were safe and confrontation with Israel was legitimate. Iran showcased missiles it claims can hit Israel. While Israel has not confirmed involvement in the Damascus strike, it acknowledges operations against Iran, a supporter of Hamas in Gaza and Hezbollah in Lebanon. The United States is also on high alert for potential attacks targeting Israeli or American assets in the region. Furthermore, Israel, Argentina, and the U.S. have accused Iran of orchestrating the 1994 bombing of a Jewish center in Buenos Aires. Which Iran denies. Israel says Gaza war far from over after partial troop withdrawal. Lieutenant General Herzi Halavai, the chief of staff of the Israel Defense Forces, IDF, stated that despite some troop withdrawals from Gaza, the conflict in the Palestinian territory is ongoing. He emphasized that the war in Gaza is far from over, with senior Hamas officials still in hiding. The IDF aims to eliminate Hamas presence throughout Gaza and return all hostages held in the territory. While the IDF announced a withdrawal from Khan Yunus, it maintains a significant force presence in Gaza. The conflict began with a surprise attack by Hamas on Israel on October 7. Israel responded with airstrikes and a ground offensive, with plans for a potential incursion into Rafah. Over one million Palestinians are sheltering in Rafah amid widespread destruction in Gaza, with concerns growing about famine. The death toll, according to the Hamas-run health ministry, exceeds 33,000. No progress made at Cairo ceasefire talks, says Hamas official. A Hamas official stated to Reuters that no progress was made at a recent round of ceasefire talks in Cairo, which involved delegations from Israel, Qatar, and the United States. The official mentioned that there was no change in the occupation's position and thus no new developments in the talks. Egypt's Al Qahira News TV channel initially reported progress, but the Hamas official contradicted this, stating that there was no progress yet. The talks followed the arrival of CIA Director William Burns in Egypt, indicating U.S. pressure for a deal to free hostages in Gaza and alleviate the humanitarian crisis. Israel and Hamas, engaged in conflict in Gaza since October, have unresolved disagreements over their main demands, Hamas seeks an end to Israel's offensive and a full Israeli withdrawal from Gaza, while Israel seeks a hostage release deal without committing to end the conflict. Iran's foreign minister continues regional tour with Syria. Iran's foreign minister Hossein Amar Abdelayan embarked on a regional tour, starting in Muscat, where he met Omani officials and a representative of Yemen's Houthis. During his visit, the Houthis expressed their intention to continue targeting Israel-bound ships until a ceasefire is achieved in Gaza. From Oman, Amr Abdelayan traveled to Damascus, Syria, after Iran's consulate there was targeted in a suspected Israeli attack. Iran has vowed retaliation for the attack, which resulted in the death of seven Revolutionary Guards commanders. A senior advisor to Iran's supreme leader warned that Israeli embassies were no longer safe. Amr Abdelayan condemned the attack on Iran's embassy building in Damascus, accusing Israel of warmongering and attempting to expand regional conflict. Israel has not officially commented on the strike, maintaining its policy of not discussing such reports in the foreign media. Intelligence Chair Turner on Iran threat, Americans in the area remain in danger. House Intelligence Committee Chair Mike Turner expressed concerns about the safety of Americans in the Middle East following escalating tensions after Israel's alleged airstrike on an Iranian embassy in Damascus, Syria. The airstrike killed two senior members and five officers of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, prompting threats of revenge from Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. Turner emphasized that Americans in the region remain at risk, citing previous attacks by Iranian proxies against U.S. troops.
He noted the U.S. movement of additional assets to deter Iran from escalating the conflict between Israel and Hamas into a wider regional confrontation. Turner criticized the airstrike on the Iranian embassy in Syria, stating that it undermined efforts to keep Iran out of the conflict. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's spokesperson defended the airstrike, claiming the targeted building was a military base disguised as an embassy. Turner described the airstrike as very unwise and warned that it could escalate tensions across the region. Russia launches 24 attack drones overnight, Ukraine says. Russia launched approximately two dozen attack drones on Ukraine, primarily targeting critical infrastructure in the country's southern and eastern regions, according to Ukraine's Air Force. The Air Force reported destroying 17 Iranian-produced Shahid drones used by Russia in the attack over regions including Odessa, Mykolaiv, Kirovorod, Khmelnytsky, and Zydemir. Additionally, a Russia-launched KH-59 guided air missile was destroyed over the Dnipropetrovsk region. Ola Kuyper, the regional governor of Odessa, stated that four drones were destroyed over the southern region, causing damage to a logistics and transport facility and a gas station. Fortunately, there were no reported casualties. Reuters noted that they could not independently verify the reports, and there was no immediate comment from Russia. South Korea deploys second homegrown spy satellite from US. South Korea deployed its second domestically made spy satellite aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket launched from the US, enhancing its surveillance capabilities to monitor threats from North Korea. The satellite, equipped with synthetic aperture radar, SAR, technology, can produce high-resolution images of ground objects regardless of weather conditions. South Korea's defense ministry confirmed successful communication with overseas ground stations, strengthening the country's independent intelligence monitoring. Previously reliant on U.S. space-based intelligence, South Korea aims to launch five spy satellites by 2025 to bolster its reconnaissance capabilities. This effort is part of a broader initiative to develop its space program, including recent launches such as a Nuri rocket in May last year. Meanwhile, North Korea launched its first spy satellite in late November, with plans for another mission reported by specialist websites. South Korean Defense Minister Shin Wansik suggested that North Korea might launch its next spy satellite as early as mid-April. While South Korean officials believe North Korea's spy satellite capabilities are basic, they acknowledge its potential to enhance targeting for new missiles aimed at South Korea and Japan, where most of America's regional military personnel are stationed. Philippines will continue dialogue with China to ease South China Sea tensions, says President. Philippines President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. urged China to engage in dialogue to prevent further incidents such as vessel collisions and the use of water cannons in the South China Sea. Despite ongoing talks with China, Marcos emphasized the importance of exhausting all options to communicate with Chinese leadership and avoid escalating tensions in the region. He expressed hope that a recent joint maritime activity involving Japan, Australia, the United States, and the Philippines would help reduce incidents at sea with China. The maritime cooperative activity, conducted by the defense forces of the four nations, involved five warships in the South China Sea. Additionally, leaders of Japan, the United States, and the Philippines are set to hold a summit in Washington later this week to address recent incidents in the South China Sea. The Chinese embassy in Manila has not yet responded to requests for comment. Australian lawmaker visiting Taiwan broaches sensitive topic of security cooperation. During a meeting with President Tsai Ing-wen in Taipei, Andrew Wallace, deputy chair of Australia's Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, broached the topic of security cooperation with Taiwan, emphasizing both sides' interest in maintaining regional stability. Despite lacking formal diplomatic ties with Taiwan due to China's claims over the island, Australia, like other major U.S. allies, has expressed growing concern over Beijing's military pressure tactics. Wallace highlighted the importance of security cooperation in an evolving geopolitical landscape, stressing the shared commitment to peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific region. He mentioned existing defense cooperation, joint naval exercises, intelligence sharing, and cybersecurity initiatives between Taiwan and Australia. Australia values its unofficial relationship with Taiwan, encompassing trade, investment, people-to-people -people ties, and regional security collaboration. The visit coincided with ongoing naval exercises involving Australia, the United States, Japan, and the Philippines in the South China Sea.
The U.S. State Department's remarks suggested that initiatives like the AUKUS submarine project could deter potential Chinese aggression against Taiwan. President Tsai underscored Taiwan and Australia's shared defense of freedom and democracy, emphasizing the need for democracies to unite against authoritarian expansionism. Taiwan's government rejects China's sovereignty claims, asserting the right of the island's people to determine their future. China sending Russia rifle scopes, tank parts, and rocket fuel. China has increased support for Russia's war in Ukraine by supplying rifle scopes, tank components, rocket fuel, satellite images, microelectronics, propellants for missile production, and turbojet engines, according to U.S. officials. This support, which bypasses Western sanctions, underscores China's growing involvement in the conflict. While Beijing initially avoided overtly backing Russia's military actions, its stance appears to have shifted as Russia gains ground in eastern Ukraine. Analysts suggest that China's silent support for Russia's war machine reflects a strategic calculation that Russia has the upper hand. Despite concerns about potential U.S. secondary sanctions, China continues to supply crucial machinery for Russia's arms production. The Kremlin, facing Western sanctions, has turned to China as its main economic partner, with China becoming Russia's largest gas client and yuan replacing other currencies in trade transactions. U.S. officials have warned China about the consequences of supporting Putin, but Beijing may perceive these warnings as hollow, given past instances of limited repercussions. As Europe severed ties with Russia following the invasion of Ukraine, the Kremlin has increasingly relied on China for economic support, including currency swaps and trade relations. U.S. will push China to change policy that threatens American jobs, Treasury Secretary Yellen says. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen concluded four days of talks with Chinese officials in Beijing, emphasizing the Biden administration's concern about China's industrial policies and their impact on U.S. jobs. Yellen highlighted issues such as manufacturing overcapacity in China, particularly in sectors like electric vehicles, batteries, and solar energy equipment, where Chinese subsidies have led to rapid expansion of production. She warned that China's excessive capacity could flood global markets with cheap products, threatening the viability of foreign firms, including American companies. Yellen urged China to shift its policies and address overcapacity, emphasizing the need for balanced growth. While it remains uncertain how China will respond to these calls, Yellen stressed the importance of addressing the issue during talks. Additionally, Yellen warned against companies, including those in China, providing support to Russia's war in Ukraine, stating that they would face significant consequences, including potential U.S. sanctions. The talks also covered national security concerns related to Chinese companies supporting Russia. Yellen met with China's central bank governor, Pan Gongsheng, during her visit. Trump says he will disclose abortion policy on Monday. Donald Trump announced that he would unveil his long-awaited abortion policy on Monday, suggesting it will be a compromise position likely to provoke both sides of the debate. Trump indicated his policy will include exceptions for rape, incest, and protecting the life of the mother. While specifics were not provided, it's anticipated that Trump will propose a less restrictive federal ban compared to laws like the six-week prohibition in states such as Florida and Georgia. Trump argued that a moderate stance on abortion is necessary for Republican success in upcoming elections. The regulation of abortion has been left to individual states since a 2022 Supreme Court decision removed constitutional protection for the procedure. Trump has faced pressure from anti-abortion groups to clarify his stance since securing the Republican nomination. A less stringent proposal may dissatisfy anti-abortion advocates while energizing abortion rights groups concerned about potential federal bans under Republican leadership. President Joe Biden has made Trump's opposition to abortion rights a focal point of his re-election campaign. Democrats score victory with no labels decision to call it quits. Democrats celebrated a tactical victory as no labels, a group advocating for a potential third-party presidential bid, announced the discontinuation of its efforts. Democratic strategists had closely monitored the centrist group's activities, fearing it could recruit a prominent challenger to President Biden and former President Trump. After failing to unveil a candidate despite multiple deadlines, no labels leaders conceded, alleviating concerns among Democrats about a third-party threat in the upcoming elections. The group had aimed to place a candidate on enough state ballots to challenge Biden and Trump, emphasizing dissatisfaction with the two leading choices. Despite extensive efforts, including exploring various names across the political spectrum, no labels failed to identify credible candidates, leading to its decision to stand down. 
Democrats viewed this development as a relief and validation of their opposition efforts. They had mobilized against no labels, arguing that its unity goal would ultimately benefit Trump. While the focus now shifts to independent candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Democrats remain vigilant, redirecting their efforts to thwart his third-party bid. No labels closure marks a strategic victory for Democrats, who aim to utilize their resources to defeat Trump and prevent third-party spoilers in the upcoming election. U.S. Lawmakers Strike Deal on Data Privacy Legislation Key U.S. lawmakers, Senator Maria Cantwell and Rep. Kathy McMorris-Rogers, announced on Sunday a bipartisan agreement on draft data privacy legislation. The proposed legislation aims to restrict the collection of consumer data by technology companies and empower Americans to control the selling or deletion of their personal information. It would require disclosure if data is transferred to foreign adversaries and grant individuals control over the use of their personal information. The bill would give broad authority to the Federal Trade Commission and state attorneys general to oversee privacy issues and establish enforcement mechanisms. While targeted advertising would not be banned, consumers would have the option to opt out. The legislation also addresses penalties for privacy violations, including fines. The proposed law seeks to establish a national data privacy and security standard, providing individuals with the right to control their personal information. Additionally, it includes provisions for affirmative express consent before transferring sensitive data to third parties and allows consumers to sue violators for damages. The bill also mandates annual reviews of algorithms to prevent harm or discrimination. Former Wisconsin gas station chain owner Tony Weed expected to announce run for Gallagher seat. Tony Weed, a former owner of Wisconsin's Dino Stop gas station chain, is expected to announce his candidacy for Representative Mike Gallagher's seat in Wisconsin's 8th Congressional District. Weed's announcement comes after Trump-aligned GOP consultant Alex Bruzwitz decided not to run and instead back Weed. Bruzwitz cited Weed as the strongest candidate to win both the primary and general elections. Trump endorsed Weed on his Truth Social platform, criticizing incumbent Roger Roth as a rhino and endorsing Weed's commitment to MAGA principles. Gallagher's early retirement has left his seat vacant. And Weed will face primary competition from State Senator Andre Jock and former State Senator Roger Roth. The district leans heavily Republican, with Trump winning it by over 15 points in 2020. The announcement is set to take place at an event hosted by Bruzewitz in Green Bay, with notable attendees including CEO Kurt Voss and furniture retailer Jim Green.